I do this, uh, call people up for this live demo hour. Um, uh, I spoke to this next guy, Brian Mallow, who, by the way, is from the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences, our host. Let's give a big round of applause to our host museum. So I said, what kind of stuff do you do? He said, I'm a science comedian. I'd never heard of a science comedian before. This is like great. Everybody else is carrying like leaf blowers, liquid nitrogen. This guy just like walks on and says, give me that mic. It's going to be awesome. But let me tell you about some of his credits. He has worked for NASA, NSF, AAAS, AGU, and um, a lot of other acronyms. Um, he has even done science videos for Time Magazine. This is going to be a treat. Come on up on stage. Let's hear it for Brian Mallow. All right, thank you, Eddie. Hello. How are you? How are you? Good. Welcome. My name is Brian Mallow, and I'm not a doctor, but I play one of the broken dreams of my parents. Thank you. Technically, that wasn't a joke. Walk it off. I was actually opening up to you and some of you laughed, so now I understand how it's gonna be. It was a little test, actually. I haven't always been a comic. I used to be an astronomer, but I got stuck on the day shift, which sucks. <laughs> you don't discover anything good. You're like, whoa, a cloud? Right, do I get to name this one? It's weird to do stand-up during the day. Comics perform at night, and I've always been a night person. Even when I was a kid, I used to hate it when my parents made me go to bed early. I would fight about it and lose, but on my way to my room, I'd say something like, well, you can make me go to my room, but you can't make me go to sleep. Which probably would have been true, except my dad was an anesthesiologist. <laughs> you know, no dad, not the mask. <laughs> my mom would come up a couple hours later and tuck me in, check the IV and the EKG. <laughs> it took more than an alarm clock to get me up in the morning. My mom used to always tell me to stand up straight when she wasn't sedating me. Stand up straight. Do you ever get that from your mom? Really, that's such a mom thing to say. I think mothers have been telling their kids to stand up straight for longer than we realize. Perhaps even to pre-human days. What if that were the driving force behind the evolutionary trend to walk erect? Mothers nagging their children up the evolutionary ladder. Stand up straight. Don't drag your knuckles when you walk. What are you, born in a tree? You want the other families to think we're not evolving? <laughs> I was always a curious kid. At least that's what the neighbors said. Um, I think they meant well. I remember once I was about 10 years old and I asked my dad, why is the sky blue? It's a pretty natural question for a little 10 year old scientist. And my dad was having none of it. He was like, go ask your mother. So I thought, cool, she knows. I was very optimistic. I went off in search of my mom and I really felt like I was experiencing the scientific method like I was following in the footsteps of Galileo and Newton. And I remember I found my mom, I was so excited. I said, Mom, why is the sky blue? And I'll never forget her answer, because I said so. At first I was in awe of my mom. Later I learned not to trust her in matters of science. Maybe she's not the authority. I noticed a long time ago, whenever my mom would lose weight, my dad would gain weight. And when my dad lost weight, my mom gained weight. It was like the conservation of mass within our family. I had a theory that you never actually lose weight, you just give it to somebody else. Fat can be neither created nor destroyed. It's one of the basic laws of the universe. One time my dad's love handles got so big, they just broke off. My theory didn't predict that. I had a pretty frightening experience a few days ago. I live here in Raleigh and I was sitting at a cafe and I noticed in the display case behind me, someone had put pasta and antipasta right next to each other. That joke requires a little bit of knowledge of both <laughs> physics and Italian food. So I understand that like the Venn diagram for the audience for that joke is just like about seven people right here. But thanks for laughing. Appreciate that. So uh, see if I can tell you a little bit about myself. I went to a magnet school for bipolar students. <laughs> that may not be the last pun you hear. I love movies. I saw a movie recently with my friend uh, Chuck. I don't like seeing movies with Chuck because he always has to sit in the front row because he thinks he gets to see the movie before anybody else. And you can't argue with him because he always has the same last word. The speed of light is finite, Brian. And it's true.
true, the speed of light's finite, but it's very fast. Anyone know the speed of light? Yeah, and thank you for not going metric, because I'm an American, and I can't handle those round numbers of 10. Yeah, that's impossible for me. But 186,000 miles per second. So if you had a theater, here's what I told Chuck, if you had a theater 186,000 miles long, you would only see the movie one second before the guy in the last row. And he said, yeah, but you'd hear it a week and a half before him. And yes, I did do the math for that joke, if you're even <laughs> mildly curious. So man, the years are flying by. I have a birthday coming up, and it's shocking uh, as I get older. I mean, I know we're all getting older at about the same rate, and unless you drive really fast. That was for you, Einstein. They weren't quite with it, so I think you need to get the word out a little more. Um, <laughs> I don't really care. I just... The only thing I really wish for myself is that I, I hope I age gracefully, you know? Like, I've had gray hair for years. I don't care. I don't care if it goes all gray. I don't care if it goes blue. I don't care if it goes ultraviolet. In fact, that's what I'll say if I lose my hair. I'm not bald. I have hair. It's just outside your visible spectrum. <laughs> we do change our behavior as we get older. Like, my wife, I noticed, has started dressing in bright colors. I think to trick predators into thinking she's poisonous. Yes. My wife is really beautiful and uh, striking and she's taller than me. She's a couple inches taller than me, which took a little getting used to because most of my life I dated women who were shorter than me. In fact, like my, my ex-girlfriend, uh, I'm not very tall, but she was a lot shorter than me. In fact, the first time I saw her, I thought she was farther away than she actually was. We kind of bumped heads and was like, whoa, hey. And uh, as, as long as I've... Uh, dated and mingled with the opposite sex. I don't feel like I know that much about the opposite sex. And I think all genders can probably, all the genders can probably say that. All the many genders can probably say that. Um, <laughs> women have passed through my life like exotic particles through a cloud chamber, leaving only vapor trails for me to study for clues to their nature. <laughs> I know most of you are going, that was not a joke. That was like a poem or something. <laughs> Somebody better tell him. You ever look back at your life and try to figure out where the screw-ups began? Like, where was the first one? I was a cesarean birth, so right there, birth, I screwed that up. Right out the chute, you know? I didn't even come down the chute. I busted out some side exit. I think that's why I have a bad sense of direction. And I'm half serious about this, because there I was, nine months in the womb. When it came time to leave, I started heading for the exit, which was clearly marked. Suddenly there's a shaft of light from behind me. Two of the biggest hands I've ever seen are pulling me this way. I'm going, it's this way, right? Like, no, this way. I'm going, I know this is where I came in. <laughs> so I want to leave you with a little series of jokes that if you've ever heard anything from my act, it may be these jokes. And uh, I just want to set them up by telling you how I came to write these um, absurd jokes. And it's that I actually did a show many years ago at, uh, at an Aztec member, the Koshlin Science Museum in Washington, D.C. And it went really well, surprisingly, I know, you're saying. And uh, they said, we'd like to have you back next year with a whole new act, which comedians always love hearing that. And not only that, but we'd like to, could you do an act to go along with our new exhibit on infectious disease? <laughs> So they wanted a comedy show about infectious disease. And I said yes, because I wanted the gig. And then I went home and I was like, oh, what have I just committed to? And then I thought about it, I was like, you know what though? Bill Cosby could probably do half an hour on having a cold. And then I realized I'm not Bill Cosby. <laughs> Very few people are. But uh, with a little work and uh, with help from my, uh, my wife, uh, we came up with a lot of stuff, and that's how we started to, uh, like I was thinking about viruses, for instance, that's where I started. I was thinking about viruses and how they're, they're not necessarily even a life, it's debatable whether they're a life form, because they can't do all the things that we define life by. They have to get into a host organism to do some of the things they need to do. So, uh, but once they're in, then they take over the cellular machinery. It's just sort of like a hostile takeover, like your cells under new management. It's weird, it's kind of like going into a Coke factory and having them make Pepsi. Or maybe weirder, like going into a, a Nike factory and having them make Twinkies or something. And if you think about this stuff too hard, here's the kind of jokes you come up with. A virus walks into a bar. The bartender says, we don't serve viruses in this bar. The virus says, the virus replaces the bartender and says, now we do. 
An infectious disease walks into a bar. The bartender says, we don't serve infectious diseases in this bar. The infectious disease says, well, you're not a very good host. <laughs> Groaning is acceptable. <laughs> Two bacteria walk into a bar. The bartender says, we don't serve bacteria in this bar. The bacteria say, but we work here. We're staff. <laughs> A room temperature superconductor walks into a bar. The bartender says, we don't serve any superconductors in this bar. The room temperature superconductor leaves without putting up any resistance. A neutrino walks into a bar. The bartender, do you know neutrino? The bartender says, we don't serve neutrinos in this bar. The neutrino says, uh, hey, I was just passing through. You can look that up later on Wikipedia. 10,000 electrons walk into a bar. The bartender was shocked. <laughs> a statistician walks into a bar, just your average bar. The bartender says, we don't serve statisticians in this bar. The statistician says, well, you're just mean. <laughs> a radio wave walks into a bar. The bartender says, can I get you anything? The radio wave says, no, nah, I'm just here for the reception. <laughs> the Higgs boson walks into a church. In Geneva, the bar the uh, priest. <laughs> they don't technically have bartenders at Geneva. No, so. so the guy says, uh, "We don't allow your kind here." The Higgs boson says, "But without me, how can you have mass?" Uh, that's what comics go for. Forget laughing and clapping. Ah, that's the gold mine right there. Schrodinger's cat walks into a bar and doesn't. <laughs> Come on, Al. And finally, gratefully, perhaps, some helium gas drifts into a bar. The bartender says, we don't serve noble gases in this bar. The helium doesn't react. You guys have been great. Thank you very much.